Welcome to Legacy Chiller Systems. My name is Dwayne Ribley. I'm with the Fluid Process Design Department and this video is about how to buy a chiller. Let's talk about your time. Your time is very valuable and in today's fast-paced market buying a chiller can be a very difficult task. If you run a business you probably don't have enough extra time to research and learn about chillers. This video will help guide you through the process of sizing a chiller correctly and give you the confidence that your equipment will be cooled properly. So let's get into how a chiller is sized. A chiller is sized based on three factors. The first factor is the E entering and leaving water or water glycol temperatures. The next is flow rates. That can be your gallons per minute or your liters per minute. And then we have our constant for water. Our, okay, let's make sense of what I just spoke about. So you'll have 55 degree fluid return temperature back to the chiller. You'll have 45 degree fluid supply temperature back to your process. So that's going to be a 10 uh, temperature difference. You got 20 gallons per minute, and you have your constant for water. So if you take those three factors, you take 10 uh, temperature difference times 20 gallons per minute times 500, you'll come up with 100,000 BTUH. If you want to convert that into tons, you would just divide that by 12. One thing to keep in mind is every process is different. Processes are going to have different temperatures differences, different supply temperatures, different gallons per minute. And as long as you could take your temperature difference between the entering, the leaving water temperature, gallons per minute, you times it by 500, you always come up with your BTUH. Air or water cooled chillers. I'm going to go over some of the comparisons and the differences between the two. Chillers have two sides to them. They have a process water side and a refrigeration side. Air and water cooled chillers have the same process water side. An air cooled chiller's heat is rejected through fans. A water cooled chiller's heat is rejected to another water source such as building water or a cooling tower. There's really not much of a, of a difference between the two of an air and water cooled. It's really just basically how the heat is rejected. Now I have some... I want to go over a couple brief uh, diagrams here. And if you look on this YouTube channel, I have a couple videos that I went into more detail on air and water cooled chillers. Go check them out. This is the processed water side of a chiller. And on an air cooled and a water cooled they're going to have the same process water side. So they're all going to have uh, the refrigerant to fluid heat exchangers. They're going to have a tank. Some are tankless. Uh, and then you're going to have your pumps. Here's an air-cooled chiller refrigeration diagram. And what makes the air cooled different than the water cooled is that the heat is rejected through fans. And then the heat is rejected to the atmosphere. So the compressor will compress the low-pressure liquid into a high-pressure gas. High-pressure gas is going to go into the condenser. The air is going to blow over the condensers. The second law of thermodynamics will happen. And then the heat will reject it to the atmosphere. So that's basically an air-cooled chiller. On a water-cooled chiller, same thing. Uh, you're going to see the, the refrigeration system almost looks identical uh, to the air-cooled. But the water-cooled condenser, instead of the heat being rejected to air, the heat is rejected to another water source, such as building water or a cooling tower. So your compressor will compress the low-pressure liquid to a high-pressure gas. The high-pressure gas is going to go to the water-cooled condenser, and the heat will be rejected to another water source. Go check those videos out, and you'll get a, a lot better uh, description of it. Let's talk about ambient conditions for air-cooled chillers if your chiller is outside. 
Choosing the right low ambient controls can be very helpful if you are in colder climates. If you don't have the correct low ambient control on your chiller, your refrigeration system could shut down. What you need to do is find out the coldest outdoor temperature where the chiller will be placed. And there are a few different options we can pick from. Different options from uh, if your coldest outdoor ambient is 40, or if your ambient is uh, 20, or if you're minus 30, uh, there are different options that we can look into. If your chiller goes indoors and it's air cooled, make sure there's enough ventilation for the heat to be rejected. If any kind of pressure is put back on the fans because of uh, improper ventilation, uh, the, the chiller refrigeration system will shut down. Pump selection is very crucial to your chiller selection and I'm gonna go over a couple quick items that you might need to know. Uh, first is the PSI, which is pounds per square inch. Uh, it can be understood as the amount of force that is exerted on an area of one square inch. And what this means to you when it comes to pump selection is that can your pump selection overcome the pressure drop of your equipment and piping? If it doesn't, you won't have the cooling that you need for your equipment. Uh, gallons per minute, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's different pumps for different types of processes. Uh, there's high pressure, low flow systems. Uh, you're gonna have um, 40 PSI, but you might only have three gallons per minute. Uh, we call that WinMS pumps. On the other end of the spectrum, there is low pressure, high flow systems. So you might only have like five PSI, but you might have 50 gallons per minute. There's all different types of pumps for different processes. But what's important is that you select the pump that overcomes both the pressure drop and gallons per minute. And here's a little bit of an uh, inside um, thing you might want to know. Always select a pump around the middle of the curve for the best performance. Uh, I've seen a lot of people select pumps um, on one extreme of the curve and or on the other. And if you call in here in the office, we'll help you uh, guide you through that. Um, but if you're on your own, make sure that you are selecting the pump um, around the middle of the curve. System volume is another crucial aspect to chiller uh, sizing and selection. System volume can be in either piping or in a tank. System volume is the water or water glycol mix that goes to your equipment to cool it. Now, for every ton of cooling, you need around two and a half to three gallons of system volume per ton. So if you have a two ton chiller, there needs to be around six gallons of volume in the system. A lot of people go with two and a half as a minimum, but we're kind of conservative here in the uh, engineering department, so we usually go with three. So uh, a tank, now a tank is just a big piece of pipe, so if you don't have a lot of pipe between your process and the chiller, a tank is a great solution for that. Now, if your tank is set up as a recirc, meaning that there's two pumps uh, in the in the in the chiller, uh, one for the evaporator loop and one for the system loop, you want to make sure you have enough volume for both the process loop and the evaporator loop. If you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to give us a call here at the office. Dual or single stage compressors. A single stage compressor is one larger single circuit. Dual compressors are two smaller compressors that have independent circuits. Having independent circuits is good because if one of your compressors goes down, the other compressor could still run and not be affected by the other failed compressor. Most manufacturers only have one circuit if they run two compressors. Always ask about this. Our chillers are designed for mission critical applications and if one compressor goes down and you have a single circuit, your whole chiller is down. If you have one compressor that goes down with an independent circuit, you will still have some capacity while the other one can be fixed or replaced. Let's summarize what we need to know to size a chiller properly. First thing you need to know is the entering and leaving water temperature to your equipment, what flow rate you need that fluid at, and what pressure drop 
uh, through your piping and through your piece of equipment that will help select your pump. You're going to need to find out if you need glycol or not. You got to find out what the lowest ambient and the highest ambient where the chiller will be placed. If you have a water cooled chiller, find out what the condensing water temperature is. That is the temperature of the fluid uh, from the building water or cooling tower. And you need to find out if you need a tank or not. If there is not enough fluid in the piping, you need to go with a tank. My name is Dwayne Ribley. I'm with Legacy Chiller Systems. I'm with the Fluid Process Design Department. And if you have any questions about this video or if you have any questions about chillers or design needs, don't hesitate to give us a call here at our office. I'd be glad to help you. Thanks for joining us today.